Um, I would like to welcome um, one of our keynote speakers for this year, um, Reed Wick. Uh, part of the reason is because we got connected through the Recording Academy, but then I think we started talking a lot more about how solutions from outside Alaskans need to be paying attention to. We often either get grabby hands and kind of grab a thing and are like, why won't it fit here? You know, try to do the exact same thing here. Or else we get a little bit proud and like, we don't need to know what you think, right? Um, I'm really interested in finding out what other folks are doing. So the next few segments, the next few speakers are for looking at cool stuff that is happening in other places. To kick us off, Reed Wick. I guess it's the big button, the big button. I'm going to set my timer because I know I can ran, ramble on, like Led Zeppelin would say. So uh, thank you for having me. It's my first time in Alaska, too. This is an amazing place. So I got here on Tuesday and took in Girdwood, and I'm here for the weekend and then heading with Marion and a few other folks down to Juno on Monday. So I'm getting uh, not the whole tour, but a good tour. Um, but as was mentioned, um, I'm with the Recording Academy. I'm one of Timmy's uh, colleagues. I am based in New Orleans. Um, I'm part of a chapter that's based in Memphis that covers from St. Louis down to, New down to New Orleans, up and down the Mississippi River. And you may ask yourself, why would somebody from New Orleans uh, want to come up here and talk? Um, but, you know, thinking about your theme, uh, obstacles to opportunities, that is exactly what we deal with every day. I mean, we th in New Orleans... For those of us who are old enough, because some aren't, um, we have a pre-Katrina life and a post-Katrina life. Life is totally different after Katrina. So is our music community. And we've had a lot of obstacles, obstacles to overcome. Similarly, we all felt the, the COVID downfall. And in a city where tourism is our biggest industry and music is a big part of that, we actually were put out of work for a long time as well. I'm a full-time musician as well as a full-time uh, working working for the Recording Academy, and one of my areas of, uh, I guess, expertise, I hate saying that because I'm not an expert in anything, but is working in the public policy and economic development space. It's something that I've been very passionate about. And it really comes from many years of watching my elders across New Orleans with commissions and task force and everything else, bitch and complain, talk about all these things that need to be fixed, but no one lifted a finger to actually do it, right? And I'm like, as I got older, and especially after Katrina, it made me realize, okay, now I'm one of those somewhat elders, and it's my turn. And really what I felt like um, is that we had to change the whole way we approach things. Approach things, I should say. So uh, let me get my thing going here. Oh, I passed it up. So these are the, f the areas that I really felt like we needed to change our attitude as a music community. Oh, it didn't change. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Sorry. There you go. Uh, we, we needed to decide to act and lead. So that kind of fell on me and some of my colleagues. Luckily, my, my bosses at the Recording Academy gave me the freedom to be able to, to take on some of this work. Um, one of the biggest things that I realized is that we needed to change the conversation, meaning that um, primarily for our purposes, we needed to change the conversation away from art and culture as much. And I know you're going to start throwing tomatoes at me for this, but... But essentially, when you're talking with business leaders, um, elected leaders, what they understand is they understand jobs, they understand economic impact, they understand those kind of things, especially when I always felt like music was being wagged by the dog of tourism. And I've tried to flip that conversation around because we wouldn't have the tourism if we didn't have the music that comes from New Orleans, right? And people throw in food and architecture, those things too, but... Really, music is what makes us special. Uh, this is going back to advocacy. Advocacy, to me, is a, a big area of uh, where we launched this whole initiative. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. And then rallying the troops. In this case, it's calling all my friends, getting my Recording Academy members, getting the local business communities together so that we can go to Baton Rouge, our state capital, we can go to City Hall, and we can talk and make our voice heard. And to me, that's the most important thing. I'm just going to buzz through these really quickly. But 
advocacy really is uh, is making yourself aware of what needs to be changed and then be in that conduit to actually uh, arm yourself with that knowledge and be able to talk to your business leaders, your legislators, whatever that might be, so that they have a, a really good understanding of it as well. Um, and this is one of the things I like to tell my fellow musicians is that your voice is more powerful than the average citizen. For one, we have an audience, right? When we go play gigs, we actually can affect through our music, through our, what we say on stage, we actually can affect change a lot more than the average citizen. So why don't we harness that power and actually put it to use? Um, and then the other thing that I would always hear from folks when I try to rally the troops is like, well, I don't know any of these politicians. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I'm like, they're just people. And actually, one of the things I've learned the most is that they are bombarded with so many issues that if you don't make your voice heard, you just don't exist. In their minds, you just don't exist. And that's just the fact of them being bombarded by so many issues. And so my goal has been, is I've actually become friends with a lot of these politicians. They're just people. In fact, they love music. Republican, Democrat, independent, they all love music. And the other secret thing is, we bring the cool factor to them. They want to rub elbows with us, right? They want to be in a picture with us. When we do our annual advocacy day, the senators all come running because they want to get in the photo with the musicians. Why don't we harness that to our advantage, right? That's the thing I, I like to pr um, present. Go, all right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you've heard the phrase, it's all about the economy, right? We've heard that so many times. That's what the politicians understand. In Louisiana, and, and I'm gonna go through this here in a second, but uh, they understand jobs. And if you play gigs, whether it's full-time, part-time, if you're earning some money from it, it's a job. If you're the front of house guy or girl at a show, if you're running the video, if you're managing the band, if you're whatever, the ecosystem that Marion referred to, every single one of those is a job. And if you're earning money at it, it's economic impact. How do you judge that? How do you, how do you bring that together as information that you can then tell your politicians or business leaders or, or a banker or whoever it is, right? And that's what I've, I'm so pleased that y'all did this summit. I mean, the. Um, the survey, because we don't have one in New Orleans yet. In fact, we're just now um, starting to embark on one that really looks more at the individual musicians and who does what. So this is based on Louisiana, obviously, but when I can show this kind of information to my politician friends, their minds are blown. They have no idea that music is worth $1.2 billion to the economy of Louisiana. This is, this, this is 2022 data. Um, the Economist collects this every year. In fact, the same year, I pulled up Alaska. Come on. This year, in 2022, Alaska's GDP was impacted by $222 million, over 5,500 plus jobs, 534 music establishments, 161 people getting royalties that they can track, and 1,300 songwriters that they've been able to track. And this is The Economist, this is, um, uh, what do you call it, the PROs, this is um, all the different organizations that collect that kind of data and then collect it with, work with The Economist to pull this data together. So in Louisiana, I'm able to point out, you know, last year we had 31 Grammy nominations from the region. Uh, we literally have, we are the festival capital of the world. I mean, we have festivals for everything. Shrimp, petroleum, you know, uh, that's one festival. Uh, we probably have 20 crawfish festivals. We probably have 50 seafood festivals. I play them all. And you know what? I'm making money. I'm taking their money. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we're missing. There's a lot of opportunity that we have uh, that we haven't taken advantage of, and we're starting to. Uh, I also like to point out that our industry is poised for growth. Uh, luckily, we have organizations like Goldman Sachs who actually track the industry as a whole. And while we think that, you know, Spotify has killed our industry and all those things, and I'm not a big fan of Spotify, actually the Recording Academy had to drink, bring me in kicking and screaming to actually get a Spotify account. But now I use it to my advantage. I actually find some really amazing music. And now that I saw that Alaska thing, I'm going to start listening to more of your music because I can find it easy. Um, but 
these numbers are impressive. Um, and I'll share this deck with everybody. I'll give it to Marion to make sure. So I don't want to spend the time going through those numbers because there's other things I'd like to cover. Um, change. All right. I think I skipped the slide. No, no, no. Um, so what are the problems that we were trying to fix in New Orleans? These are the major ones. Reverse the cash outflow earned by our artists. And I'll have a slide to demonstrate that. Reverse the brain drain of our students who graduate from these music industry programs. I come from higher ed. I helped start the music industry program at, Louis, at Loyola University in New Orleans back in the 90s. And these kids graduate and they want to work in the music industry. They've been trained to be managers and lawyers and booking agents and, and artists. And they've always traditionally had to leave New Orleans to go get a job. Um, so we want to be able to find a way to create jobs to empower our local ecosystem and keep those kids in New Orleans and, uh, and find ways to have our artists make more money from the music that they create. Come on, go. Come on. All right. Uh, so this was just one band. I used this slide uh, back in 2017. It's still the best slide uh, that explains it, but I used it for the band The Revivalists who came out of New Orleans and at the time they had just had their first number one hit. They were now going on the road making an average of 25 grand a night. Now they're up to 100 grand a night. But when you look at all, all the different services that the revivalists need to be a professional band touring are all outside of New Orleans. So all the money that's earned by these different, whether it's production people, publishing people, booking agents, you know, management, record labels, all of that leaves our economy. So how do we reverse that? How do we bring that cash flow back to our economy? And as you'll learn, I mean, I, I know I didn't get to see the numbers either, but just from talking to Marion, it sounds like y'all have lots of these pieces of this ecosystem already here, right? So being able to quantify that and be able to use that to your advantage to grow, to get people to really want to pay attention more, to, to want to participate more, I think those are all positive things. Maybe I'm pointing in the wrong direction. Okay. So this basically just kind of is a bullet point list of the opportunities that we have for Louisiana. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But essentially, we have a lot of the pieces of that puzzle that are in place, and it's time for us to bring them together. So in doing this work, what it led to was the creation in 2017 of the New Orleans Music Economy Initiative. So. Um, we passed some legislation in 2017 that was really geared towards uh, growing jobs in the music industry. And I went to the state's economic development people, and they're like, well, we don't know what to do with it. So then I went to Greater New Orleans, Inc., which is our non-governmental economic development firm, and they took it on as one of the business sectors. They had grown the tech industry to a huge degree post-Katrina, and I'm like, it's the same thing. It's intellectual property. We have a lot of the pieces of this ecosystem. We need you to give us the legitimacy to be able to take this to the next level. So that's what we did. We created a multi-pronged plan. We worked with Sound Diplomacy, who did a year-long study for us. They identified about 25 different action items Go. that all got basically brought into these five different areas. And this is kind of where some of the examples that other uh, cities and, and regions can take, uh, you know, take advantage of. Many of these things are already in the works. We started this plan five years ago. We had like a two and a half year interruption with COVID, but we've started in earnest back on some of these items. Um, I have a separate slide for each one to go really quickly. How am I doing on time? Got three, four minutes left? Okay, okay. Um, so under business development, basically this is we look at music conferences both going to and attracting as business development. Because the decision makers for companies, whether it's a record label or a management company, if we can bring them into New Orleans, we call it drinking the Kool-Aid. We can bring them in and make them understand our culture. It's the same thing here. I didn't really get Alaska until I come here, right? I think y'all have the same kind of things we have. When you come to New Orleans, it's so different than reading about it or being in a brochure. It's, and I think that's the case in many cities that, we, that are around the country and around the world. It's just you need to be able to understand it. You need to be able to feel it, and you can see where the opportunities are. Then we could talk about tax incentives, cost of living, differentials, all these kind of things. So these are a number of things. Music FET is a 
like a, a, from a fam tour kind of thing, when Jazz Fest happens, we invite a dozen or so of the executives that we know are in town, and we bring them to lunch, we bring them to studios, we show them that we do have that ecosystem here, and that we could use your company to be here too. You know, you have a management company, and you manage five of our artists. Why don't you open a shop here? We'll incentivize those, those jobs. You can sign 10 more bands from New Orleans, and all of our business grows. You know, so those, that's kind of the mindset. Uh, another thing that we just created this for, for the first time this year is NOLA Music Con. And for year one, we had 465 registrants from 22 states, as well as Canada and UK. And we're already working on year two. And um, those are all positive things moving us forward in the right direction. All right. Did we go to the next one? No, I went the wrong way. So public policy, this is kind of the space that I'm most active in. Um, we've been real successful the last few years of really building those relationships in Baton Rouge. In the past few years alone, we've, been, we've passed these, these laws. Some are economic development oriented. Some of them are just protecting um, our artists and their creations. Um, we do an annual music advocacy day at the state capitol where I have Members of the music community from every corner of the state come in, and we get recognized in the Senate, in the House, and it just gives us an opportunity to let them know that we are here, that we have an impact, and that you should support us. And then we come to them with specific legislation to be able to, um, to work with us to move it forward. Um, this year, in 2024, we're actually working with the state's Commerce Committee, and we're embarking on a statewide music study. And it's not really the same kind of study as the survey, it's, we calling it a music study. We have so many new legislators. We have a new governor. We have new chairs of all the committees. We have a new president of the Senate. We have a new president, uh, speaker of the House. So the study is really a, a smokescreen for us to have an opportunity to go meet with them in every corner of the state and talk about why music is important to their part of the state because it's everywhere in Louisiana. New Orleans is, you know, the big fight is it's New Orleans against the rest of the state. But we always have to talk about how there is great music coming from every corner of the state. And so by guising, you know, disguising it as a study resolution, uh, so luckily I'm good friends with the Chair of the Commerce Committee. She bought into it, and we're, uh, we just started that in October, and it's going to run through 2020. But at the same time, some of the incentives that we created in 2017, we have an opportunity in 2025 to, to tweak those incentives and move them forward and make them better. So that's part of the, the disguise of this music study. Um, some things that were part of the plan that have actually come to fruition. We now have a state level music officer. She started last year, uh, my friend Lacey Chatagne. And we now in New Orleans have a nighttime economy office. We have a, third, a three person office that looks at not only the music, but restaurants. Because in a city like New Orleans, so much of the economic activity happens after dark. So that's a real important one for us. Uh, try and wrap these up really quickly. Maximizing existing assets. I couldn't fit hardly any of this on this page, but everything from Miked Up is a program. We got a quarter million dollar grant from economic development at the state level to actually create this, incent, uh, this internship program. I call it an internship program on steroids, where a kid that's in a senior in college can get an internship with a management company or a booking agency, and they actually give them on-the-job training, and then that first year after they graduate, the grant pays for their salary for a year, and they build their network, and they build their book of business, and they can either make a decision at the end of that full two-year period of, do I stay with this company? Do I start my own company? Do they help me get placed with another company? So these are the kind of things, like, it goes beyond what you can learn in the classroom, and it really helps these kids, and some of them are just amazing, because we just graduated our first cohort last year, second one just started this, uh, this current school year, and uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, other things, Music Trail, which is a year behind. <laughs> it's Louisiana. But uh, the, the lieutenant governor has declared 2024 as the, the year of music for Louisiana. He was supposed to unveil the, uh, the Music Trail website on January 1st. It's January 13th, and no sign of it yet, but that's Louisiana. Um, but I was fortunate to be part of a a year and a half planning process that actually helped identify the right spots all over the state, right? Um, this I threw in here last night because I didn't even think about it until we had our little meeting last night, but for the last three mayoral candidates races, we've actually hosted a mayoral candidates forum where we actually had all the candidates running for mayor for our past three mayors 
and we gave them questions strictly about music and what would you do to empower music to support it. And uh, it's, it's actually a great way to open their eyes to, wow, you know, there's some real stuff happening here. I need to be supportive of this. Uh, and this is one that's been really cool. There's more than this, but these are the two that I thought would be the most interesting. Is uh, We did a partnership, and I, missed, I didn't capitalize Guild, uh, with the Guild of Music Supervisors and the New Orleans Film Festival. This was the year right before COVID, and we're going to reinstitute it next year. We couldn't get it done the last couple of years. But what we did was we, had a, we worked with a couple of nonprofits, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Ella Project, who actually did like a four-month course leading up to the film festival. And working with the Guild and uh, Miles and I's mutual friend, Jonathan McHugh, we brought in five music supervisors who were actually working on real-world projects. Each, five, each of the five gave us five projects, and we matched the ones who were looking for hip-hop. We matched them with hip-hop artists. If they were looking for soundtracky kind of music, we'd put them with some classical people. If they were looking for R&B, we... And 75 of our musicians were able to pitch their music on the weekend of the film festival, and 12... Oh, 12 that's, that's my two-minute warning. Uh, 12 of them got... Got actual real, I mean, a couple of them got real placements. Twelve of them got really sniffed out pretty well. The byproduct is all of those music supervisors left saying, wow, I didn't realize New Orleans had all this different kinds of music, you know, because they think of us as like trad jazz, like some old museum piece, right? Um, another one that just happened this past October was we, host, we co, uh, co-hosted and the Grammys were a part of it, uh, put together through our songwriters and composers wing, a first ever New Orleans songwriting camp. And we brought some of the best songwriters from around the region to mix, mix them with our songwriters. And they wrote 40 songs in five days. And one of the songs is in the color purple. So they, had, they brought in some music uh, supervisors and A&R folks who were looking for music right there on the spot. And uh, one of them is, is in that movie that just, got, that just came out, the remake. And it's uh, pretty amazing to see. Marketing, this is the biggest thing that we've always needed because getting the powers that be to take music seriously and that we should be marketing it has been one of my pet peeves. Elizabeth, who you'll hear from in a minute, and I both have degrees in public relations and it like drives me crazy when we have this amazing set of resources or whatever right under our nose and the powers that be didn't take care of it. So we've done a whole bunch in this space. Uh, we've de- we came up with a slogan for our initiative. We had the city declare October New Orleans Music Month. Um, That led to Billboard magazine. After five years of trying to get Billboard to write about New Orleans, they finally did in April of 2023. They did a multi-page spread on New Orleans and our growing music economy. Um, And some of the other things. One of the things that we're we're doing during the Grammys, uh, two days before the Grammys is when we're in Los Angeles, is we're having an alumni reception with young alums who went to Loyola, Tulane, Xavier, Dillard, who live out in L.A. and work in the music industry, and we're going to empower them to be our ambassadors so that when they hear of a company that's looking to expand and they're thinking about Atlanta or Houston, like, what about New Orleans? You know, so those are some of the things that we're really trying to push. And my final slide, this is the toughest one because building physical infrastructure, which is really important, is the toughest nut to crack uh, because this really takes investment, it takes developers, but we've seen some progress. Um, One of the biggest things that we've always wanted to have is a true music hub. There are some great examples of them all over the country, all over the world. Tile Yard in London is probably the most amazing one, where there are recording studios and writing rooms and office buildings and all these things where the entire music ecosystem can be represented. And what happens in those kind of situations is what we call creative collisions, where this songwriter runs into this A&R person that, and talks to this manager, and next thing you know, they're working together on a project, right? And, and Marion talked about, you could be doing that here, right? This is kind of a hub right here. You know, we're in it. Y'all are here. That's what's really cool, right? We have new recording studios that op- opened in the last five years. There's two in the works right now. Uh, the, we actually have two record presses in New Orleans, believe it or not. One of them, the New Orleans record press, has just expanded, bought two more presses from the Memphis mu- music press. I mean, record press, um, but they're having lots of issues with 
getting the materials to make the vinyl. So we have a team of people that's working on how can we shorten that uh, or alleviate that um, supply chain issue. Um, we're, we have a major music museum, believe it or not, New Orleans, which a lot of, oh, I'm not going to say it, but New Orleans has had, you know, a huge impact on American music, and we don't have any museums in New Orleans that really are dedicated to our music. So there's a major project in the works there. Um, and in my friends, I just had lunch with this guy about a month ago, and he told me about this project. So we have a regional backline company that works in several cities across the south. And they're in the process of moving into a new building where they can build in out some high-end rehearsal studios, which is something we desperately need in New Orleans. And they have the equipment that kind of, you know, if such and such bands coming through, they can come rent the place. They have access to all the stuff. So I just wanted to give you all like a snapshot of some of the things that we're doing in New Orleans. Uh, Marion was like, I really want, you know, don't tell us what to do. Show us some of the things y'all are doing and maybe we can walk away with some ideas. Um, so hopefully... There are some ideas. I'm around the rest of the day. I'm doing one of the office hours tomorrow. I think I'm over time, but thank you all so much.